So the other day I made a video sort of asking the question, what is even the point of the DC Extended Universe anymore? This whole entity doesn't know what it wants to be, and I don't know what it wants to be. I don't think anyone knows what it wants to be, so what's even the point anymore? Just make something that has a better idea of what it wants to be, right? I think there was a time when the DC Extended Universe did have a very clear idea of what it wanted to be, and that was when it was making those Zack Snyder, Man of Steel, Batman v Superman films, and now it's just completely changed its course for stuff that's much less episodic, much less serious, and a lot more conventional. However, I'm going to look at both sides now. I think DC has made a spectacular case for the conventional in the form of Shazam. Shazam is not your typical DC Extended Universe film, but it certainly doesn't feel like a Marvel film either. It feels like the kind of film that could exist completely on its lonesome. Yet at the same time, it is packed with references to other characters like Batman and Superman. And while these references are there, they're not a man mandatory part of the storytelling so much as they are a part of the world building of this film. In short, Shazam would have been a pretty perfect jumping off point for a DC Extended Universe. If this were the first film of DC's own cinematic universe, what Marvel is doing, this would be a great film to start that with. Now, this video essay will contain spoilers for the movie Shazam, so if you haven't seen Shazam yet, I would suggest not watching this video. Otherwise, I hope you have as much fun watching this video as I did making it. Do you remember that time in Spider-Man 2 when J. Jonah Jameson was trying to come up with names for Dr. Octopus, and he was suggested Dr. Strange, and he said, that's great, but it's taken. It was a sort of a universe reference to the possibility that Dr. Strange does exist in this world. This reference was fun, but it didn't guarantee us like a Dr. Strange movie or anything like that. It just gave us a little tidbit as to who else exists in this world. The same is true of Shazam's world building, as you see Batarangs galore, you even get a little cameo from Superman in there. But ultimately, the references are not what what makes this film, it is the characters and story. This film is kind of like Stranger Things meets Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. And that is absolutely high praise, as the whole story is about Billy Batson being a foster child, he knows his real mother is out there, and it's causing him to be very rebellious because he wants to find his mother. His foster family are all really nice people, and they're really good to him, but you can understand why he would have no time for them. You can understand why he is the way he is, is because, well, he knows his mother's out there, so what's the point of all this? You know, like, thanks, but sorry. And that's the main thing with this film, is everybody in it has understandable motivations. Every character in here feels fleshed out. It is properly world-built from the ground up, and that is more than can be said for some of the MCU films. And I'm not trying to make that really stupid, futile, banal argument that Shazam destroyed the MCU. I, I still would say that the best of the MCU I prefer to Shazam. And I think the world building is something that the MCU has definitely improved on in recent years in Phase 3. But Shazam approaches this more like a conventional film than a modern cinematic universe film, which is really well done. It doesn't feel episodic in any way, it just feels like a film. A film that is populated by well fleshed out, really enjoyable and entertaining characters with great actors to boot. I think like this generation of child stars is absolutely fantastic. And it's a testament to how great these characters are when you've got Shazam fighting against Dr. Sivana and he seems to be backed into a corner and then you see a Batarang hit Dr. Sivana and you think, oh, Batman's gonna show up, right? But then you see the kids in his foster family, but you're happy to see them. You're probably happier to see them than you would be if Batman showed up. That is a testament to how good the world building in this film is compared to other DC Extended Universe films. It's honestly hard to believe a film of this quality came from the same cinematic universe as Suicide Squad. So while we've got this very realistic story at the core of Shazam of Billy Batson trying to find his mother and rejecting his foster family, we've also got all of the fantastical elements that surround it. And this is what the film kind of leads with, with its main villain and his main villain origin story, Dr. Sivana. Dr. Sivana is not the favorite child of his father, that's for sure. He's abused, he's seen as worthless, good for nothing, and is blamed for when his father gets crippled. 
triple. We've got this little boy that needs and deserves an escape of sorts into the world of fantasy, and it looks like he's gonna get that when he's approached by the wizard, Shazam. It's a different Shazam from the one that's titled in the film, in case you didn't know. And provided he's good enough, he's basically offered all of the powers and abilities of Shazam, so that he can take down the seven deadly sins. But the old wizard Shazam denies him this, because he just isn't good enough. And this messes him up and he kind of devotes his life to trying to find this wizard and trying to gain that power that he missed out on the first time. His research is successful, but rather than gain the powers of Shazam, he instead goes to pledge his allegiance with the Seven Deadly Sins and gains their power instead, taking revenge on his father, his brother, and all who oppose him. And thus the old wizard finds himself a new champion in the form of Billy Batson, who then goes up to take on the mantle of Shazam. So the powers of Shazam is it transforms you into basically your physical peak and gives you superpowers. So that physical peak being about the time that you're in your 20s. So he gets the body of an adult, but he's still got the mind of a child. So if you went into this assuming that Shazam would be a bit like Deadpool and that he's a very jokey comedic superhero character, it's definitely not that. It's not like a parody of superheroes or anything like that. It is instead a superhero with the mind of a child. It is a completely different thing. But there's still plenty of comedy that goes with that. Now, while Billy Batson is Shazam, he's obviously got a lot of questions. Like, what the hell is this power? Where did it come from? What am I even supposed to do with this? And one of the only people that he connects with is his little foster brother. The superhero-obsessed Freddie Freeman, who thinks it's just awesome that his new foster brother is a superhero. Now, when you've got a child who is not only a superhero but has the power to transform into an adult while doing so, an adult that is not immediately recognizable as that child, there is a lot of explaining to do and they really do explore all of this. And that's the thing I love about Shazam as a modern origin story is a lot of the time we breeze through these origin stories so fast that it's kind of like what was even the point anymore, either that or they feel ridiculously over long and take up too much of the film. In the case of Shazam it makes the origin story well worth while by taking the time to explore this newfound power and ability in the fullest, explore the context of the kid taking on those abilities, because I think you couldn't really start a Shazam movie without that origin story, and I am skeptical about any sequels coming after because of that, because I think it's very important that you establish Billy Batson's background before going into the Shazam stuff, so you can understand that the most important thing about Shazam is that he's not an adult, he's not an ordinary superhero, he is a child. But I think one of my favorite parts about this origin story is just Billy and Freddy exploring the joys of adulthood. Basically, Freddy sends Shazam in to go and buy some beer, and I'm sorry, but like, this is the most memorable quote from the film for me, and I know it's in all the trailers and stuff, but I laughed way harder than I expected to on a flight, because I saw this film on a flight. I, it was just when he says, I would like to purchase some of your finest beer, please, to the shop clerk. I just, I laughed so much. I know I've got a lot of younger viewers in my channel, Pop Audience, and maybe you guys don't realize how funny that is, but I think all of us that are above the drinking age will find that very funny. I mean, I don't know, maybe you already understand why it's funny, but if, if you don't, you, you'll know when you're older. And that's part of the fun of Shazam, is like, not only do you have this childlike lens of being a superhero, and uh, all the fun little things that can can come with that because he's a superhero that has a lot of fun in doing so like uh, he doesn't really get to saving the day or anything until like the third act but Zachary Levy or Zachary Levi I don't know how it's pronounced his delivery of all of this is so good and like I mean as an actor he's played kind of man-child roles quite a bit. I mean, if you look at uh, Prince Eugene from Tangled, he's very much the man-child of the Disney universe. So obviously a role like Shazam, where he legit is the dictionary definition of a man-child, is perfect for him. And I mean, if you've seen any behind-the-scenes stuff of Zachary Levy, seeing that he's got an action figure out of Shazam and everything, the guy is very much a man-child. And I mean that in a positive way. He's like, I'm a man-child, for example. I get overexcited about stupid things. I, I love me some food and sweets and stuff like that. I like I collect action figures sometimes if I have the money. But what I also love about this is this juxtaposition between Shazam himself and Freddy. Because the thing is, you see Freddy's story and you can't, you can't help but think, 
maybe he's the one that does deserve this. I mean, he loves superheroes. He's a good person. He's pretty pure of heart. He's got a bum deal with his uh, crutches. You know, he has to walk on crutches and everything. Uh, it's um, truly, Freddy deserves this more than anyone else, I think. And the thing is, they actually do go into exploring that as uh, Billy Batson Shazam is, <laughs> rather than saving the day and stuff, he's instead making money out of showing people that he can shoot lightning out of his hands and singing about it. He's using his ability to turn into an adult to go into strip clubs just so he can get the chicken wings, but he's afraid of everything else that he sees in there. So this kind of creates some tension between Billy and Freddy, as well as that Freddy's kind of making demands that Shazam help him out with his bullying problem. And that's the thing is Shazam at the moment is not really very interested in helping people. He's just kind of doing it for himself. Uh, what I like is that we've got a film where the superhero is kind of in it for their own means and own gain, but without us frowning upon them because he is at the end of the day just a kid in this. And Zachary Levi is very likable performance in the role. And he doesn't exactly go dark either, he doesn't do horrible things to people. But yeah, it creates quite a rift between him and Freddy, and Freddy feels like he's the one that should have been the superhero and everything. Um, but that's just part of life really, is you're not always the one that gets chosen, and that's really sad. But Shazam himself realizes that having lightning shooting out of your hands is not always a good thing when that lightning hits a bus and it starts swerving off of a highway, and uh, the bus is going to fall and people are going to get seriously hurt. So the first thing he does is he tries to find an old mattress so that the bus can fall on that And then he tries to suggest the passengers all jump out of the bus onto it uh, Which obviously isn't going to happen So at a last ditch effort he has to catch the bus himself And it's this awesome scene of him catching it and everything I will say I don't understand the logic of this scene Surely Shazam would just bust through the bus It must have some nuclear glass on that But here's my absolute favorite moment Is when he wants to put the bus down because it's really heavy There's a dog standing in front of him and he's trying to tell the dog to move out of the way and it's just not hearing him but I mean eventually the dog moves and he puts the bus down but that is absolutely hilarious but it's when Dr. Sivana arrives on scene that basically Shazam really has to step up and take down Dr. Sivana and the seven deadly scenes but what's also great is how Freddy and the other foster children who are all really good and pure of heart they all get their reward in that they all get to become a part of the Shazam family and help Shazam to take down Dr. Sivana and the seven deadly sins once and for all and even there the, the comedy doesn't stop there like the comedy like it doesn't detract from the drama or anything but it it's very consistent with itself there's a great scene where Dr. Sivana flies up into the sky and Shazam flies up into the sky and Dr. Sivana is doing one of those uh, villain speech monologue things and it's like several blocks away from Shazam himself we've seen this kind of stuff happen with Zod and Superman in Man of Steel but I like that they actually acknowledge that there's no way that Dr. Sivana Ivana's words could carry through all that distance, so Shazam just can't even hear him. This is a thing that happens a lot in superhero movies, where when you really think about it, when the villains are doing all these big speeches to the heroes, the, the hero is so far away, there is no way the hero should ever be able to hear them. Like, I uh, think uh, the Green Goblin's sadistic choice in Spider-Man 1, Green Goblin's right at the top of the Brooklyn Bridge, Spider-Man is like miles away. That's not a criticism leveled at that superhero trope or anything, it's just me appreciating that Shazam actually does this. Now, I've been kind of talking about the comedy aspect and the really character-driven stuff here. Uh, what I will say is there are some great emotional beats in this too. There's a bit where basically Billy Batson's foster family find his mother for him and he travels all that way to go meet her. And you kind of expect it to be this wonderful reunion of sorts, but what it is is basically he finds her to find out that she basically let him go missing and deliberately didn't find him on purpose because it's her life, whatever she wants to do. That kind of hits home. And I just love that subtle roast that Billy Batson gives as he leaves, where it's like, okay, well, I've got to go get back to my real family now then, I guess. That's the point where Billy kind of accepts his new family as proper family. And like, it doesn't need to take ridiculously long. He doesn't go through any lengthy soul searching montages or anything. We're presented with these really nice people as characters and the only reason Billy Batson is not accepting them as family is because his mother's still out there. Finds the mother, she's not who he thought she was. So then, it, literally, he just goes and accepts the other ones as his family. It's it's nice, it's rational, I like that. Also, some of the locations of the battles in this film are just great. Like, they allow for so much creativity. Like, I think one of the first fights with Dr. Sivana takes place in a toy shop, and some of the toys being thrown around are Batman toys. That's great. The final battle takes place at a Christmas carnival, and Santa Claus is getting all up in the action. It's brilliant. Overall, Shazam feels like kind of a return to, like, 
the Sam Raimi Spider-Man 1 style of superhero film. And I have to tell you, that's really, really exciting because I've been missing that kind of superhero film for a while now. I'm not going to say it's my favorite superhero film of all time or my favorite DC movie, but I think, like, how conventional this film is by today's standards is what makes it unconventional. But you know what's also really awesome to see is that the director, David F. Sandberg, it, less than 10 years ago, he was making films on YouTube. And like, look how much he's achieved. Like, he started out on YouTube, and not only do we have a film, like a big budget feature film directed by a guy that got his start on YouTube and social media, it's actually really, really good. So it kind of feels like in some regard, it's like he's one of us. Overall, Shazam all around is just a win for superhero movies. It's a win for conventional filmmaking. It's a win for young filmmakers. Although I will say those end credits are, <laughs> I'm surprised I didn't get sued. I mean, a Ramon song with like scrapbook drawings over the credits. Aha, uh -huh, where have I seen that before? What do you guys think? Did you enjoy Shazam? Comment below and discuss. And as always, if you enjoyed this video and you want to see more like it, don't forget to hit subscribe, hit the like button. It's 420 as I'm recording this. And in the description below are links to my Patreon and my Discord. Sorry if the videos haven't been quite on the same standard as usual, I am jet lagged to hell. This video is brought to you by Zentai Zentai for all your cosplay needs. Link is in the description below and they are very cool and good. Cosplay your favorite characters or send in one of your own designs. Affordable prices and very high quality. Made to order and made to measure. But most of all, made to be heckin' awesome. If you couldn't already tell. Guys, can you believe where we are now and where we started? How long ago it was that Channel Pup or Channel Goat even came about? Because it really wasn't that that long when you think about it. Can you believe the amount of support I've received from this community, from, from all of you subscribing to the channel and everything? It's, it's unreal. It's a dream come true for me. But behind the YouTubers you watch usually comes a bit of a truth is that they're often dirt poor. Now I've had the good fortune of being able to grow this YouTube channel and hopefully turn it into a career, but I'm gonna need a little bit of help along the way to even the odds to make ends meet so that I can use all of the possible time that I have to make videos for you guys as opposed to doing something mundane for barely enough money to make it worth its while. I've done all that. I've lived that life. The fact is, together we all built Channel Pup. We made it what it is today and I want to keep the ball rolling on that. I don't ever want to stop doing this because this is the most gratifying job I've ever had. And I think the most pleasurable hobby anyone could ever have. I don't take any of the support that I receive from you guys for granted, but if in any way you're wondering if maybe you could do a little more for the channel even, then I want I want to direct you to the Patreon link in the description below. It would mean the world to me to have your support via Patreon. It can help me to make ends meet, it can help me to better my content, it can help me to have more time to really work on this stuff. But you know what, I'm not just going to take your support and run. No way Jose. I've, uh, in the Patreon, you can access exclusive videos via the Pups Project Room playlist where you can see different projects I've been working on or have worked on that have either not made it to YouTube for general viewing or have been cancelled or well you can get a little view of the process that goes behind the Channel Pup videos and productions. As well as that you tend to get advanced previews of the bigger Channel Pup projects, our tentpole event projects. If you've seen Marvelous Tales of Spider-Man, you'll be aware that that was released on the Patreon first, and uh, 20 days later approximately was released for general viewing on YouTube. That's not the only time I'm gonna do this. But you know what? If you can't do the Patreon, or are just not interested in doing the Patreon, I fully understand. Like, it, it's, it's still a big ask in my opinion. And what counts most is your support. So, as always, thank you so much guys, I've been Channel Pup, and I will think of a better catchphrase next time. Please!